My name's Geraldine Cox, but I go by Jerry. Uh, and I was born in Philadelphia uh, at Hahnemann Hospital, right in the center of the city. Uh, I went to Girls High, which is an academic preparation school citywide. And then I went to Drexel University, where I studied biology as an undergraduate and environmental sciences as my master's and PhD. I uh, started work with Raytheon uh, in their environmental services group. And this was at a point where women really were secretaries or teachers. And one of my colleagues told me that uh, my boss said, well, if she's a girl, if you can get her cheap, we'll hire her. Then I had his boss who could not say a sentence without a four-letter word in it. He was the son of a preacher. And uh, he would say, now, da-da-da-da-da, four-letter word, excuse me, Dr. Cox, da-da-da-da-da. And this went on forever. So finally, one of the men came in and t said that we just got a ca uh, contract to analyze the uh, mud in the bottom of one of the local rivers. And um, I, I said something like, oh, you mean we got a contract to analyze the crap? And that took care of the boss because then he was comfortable. Because if I constantly made him uncomfortable, it was not a good work environment. I think today's women just do not appreciate what we've gone through. I was chairman of the, uh, well, and organizer of the Ocean Outfall Committee of the Water Pollution Control Federation, which is now the Water Environment Federation. I was national executive vice president of my sorority and active in a lot of other things. And I was selected as one of the 10 outstanding young women in America. And the White ha uh, we went to the White House to get recognized. And one of the uh, aides to uh, Mrs. Ford sent us all White House Fellows applications. So I filled out the White House Fellows application and uh, sent it in. Didn't really know what the program was, but sent it in. And I made the regional selection, and then I was selected as a White House fellow. And I worked for spe uh, special assistant to the Secretary of Labor in the transition between Ford and Carter. Uh, we had seminars probably every day with uh, all sorts of people, both government and non-government. Uh, Robert Redford was one of the people we met, and it was funny because he wanted to discuss environment. So did I. Everybody else wanted to discuss movies. So it was like there were two levels of conversation going on. Uh, after I finished the White House Fellowship, I went to the American Petroleum Institute where I worked in the medical group uh, doing environmental toxicology. And uh, I had a boss who couldn't make a decision. You give him a decision, it would sit on his desk for weeks. So I developed a strategy that whenever he traveled, and he loved to travel, I'd go and make the decisions and he'd come home and I'd say, you weren't here, so this is what I did. And he loved it because he didn't have to make it. At any rate, um, uh, I became the vice president and technical director of the Chemical Manufacturers Association. And I was there for f about 15 years. And I was the chief spokesman for Bhopal when they had that horrible chemical incident in India. I was on an advisory committee and uh, for the uh, curriculum for the environmental program. And at the last minute, uh, they came in panicked, asking, do you know anybody that can teach environmental law and regulation? 
And I said, well, what about me? Because that's really what I did at, uh, at the American Petroleum Institute and the Chemical Manufacturers Association. So uh, they said, yeah. So I, I taught from 2001 to 2015 in the graduate school. And I had been on the um, uh, board of directors at Drexel prior to that. Alpha Sigma Alpha, it, it, the original sorority, what attracted me to that particular sorority was a creed, the creed for the sorority that they had posted on their bulletin board at Drexel. It's to fill my days with satisfying activity, to find a dominant beauty in art, literature, nature, and friendships, to love life and joyously live each day to its ultimate good. I looked at that and I said, that's how I want to live my life. So I, pl I uh, rushed the sorority, suicided, which means I only wanted that one, did not get a bid. The next year I rushed again, did not get a bid. Drexel has a five-year program. So by the third year I got the message and did not rush. They took no pledges and they only had five returning members the next fall. So they were on collapse. And the uh, Panhellenic advisor said, you know there's somebody that really wants to join. So they broke down and made, gave me a bid. I ended up uh, president of the chapter before I left. Uh, I also was advisor while I was in graduate school. And by the time I left graduate school, we had 51 members. I didn't have that much time to develop the traditional sorority bonds in college. We were so busy building up the sorority. But uh, since I've graduated, my little sister and I are in touch. Uh, and, you know, I do keep in touch with the ones that were in the uh, chapter then. But I have a long-going relationship with the collegians as they come through. I got involved in national. Uh, <laughs> oh, one day I just happened to be in Philadelphia and uh, I stopped in the chapter house and they said, oh, we're all getting ready to go to state day. Why don't you come with us? And I said, well, I'm executive vice president. I'm going to change the dynamics of the group if I go, because you don't have somebody that's at the top of the organization just showing up. So they said, we'll disguise you as a collegian. So I went in a mini skirt, a long fall, granny glasses and platform shoes. And the province director who actually reported to me comes up to me and says you look very much like one of our national officers I can't think of her name now <laughs> uh, but you look so much like her and you you look a little bit older and I said oh I, I uh, went to college later and you know I had her buffaloed and she said I'll never forgive you for that <laughs> but uh, we're good, really good friends, and, you know, of course, she forgave me. The best part of sorority life is alumni. The, you are a collegian for four or five years, and that's a great period of time. But what about the rest of your life? You can develop a network of friends that's international from your sorority. You can join alum groups or form alum groups, and you have no idea how important these support groups are, especially as you go through life's challenges. Things like miscarriages, things like cancer, which I'm going through now, Things like um, divorce, uh, 
ad advice with raising young children. The network uh, of, of jobs is important also. You have no idea how important the mentoring is in your life. And it's really a disservice to yourself not to become active and uh, stay in an alum group and develop these lifelong friendships. This really came home to me as I developed pancreatic cancer because I had surgery in Philadelphia and I had the entire Philly group come in and visit me and support me, meet me at the train station, go to the doctor's offices with me when I found out that there is no cure and that I am uh, going to die and when the period of time is. My sisters here in Virginia have been a godsend. I don't know what I'd do without them. And you really don't appreciate how important this network is until you really need it. And by the way, we have a lot of fun. We do not uh, have the many meetings that you do as uh, collegians, but we do things that mutually interest us. So each group is a little different and it's what you make for it. So for those of you who are uh, in your collegiate years, plan to join an alum group or form one. I've formed several and uh, they're still viable and it's just a pleasure to see other women sharing with each other. When I, when I was a freshman at Drexel, I met this uh, young, well, he was a little bit older man who uh, was working in the stock room, and I really liked him. So I'd go in and ask all sorts of questions, and Walter uh, later said he never thought he had met a dumber person in his life, and they, then he said, well, I realized I was the dumb one. Uh, but. You know, I've, I, I was sort of chasing him for about two years. And finally, he asks me out. He says, are you doing anything Saturday? And I said, I was, but I immediately canceled it in my mind. And he said, good, my roommate needs a date for the chemical chemistry picnic. Uh, Walter's like that. Um, and what... The fellow he fixed me up with was gorgeous, but a vacuum between the ears. So uh, as a, uh, a uh, sophomore, I uh, was in a very serious sledding accident. I was almost killed, and my leg was almost ripped off. So I had gone to uh, Drexel because I had dropped out that semester, and I'm sitting in the cafeteria with my mother, and Walter comes up, and I turn my head, and here's black and blue, and I'm on crutches. And then I, sw I had to switch uh, uh, work periods. Drexel, you work half a year, and you go to school half a year. Well, it turns out I conflicted with the girlfriend that he was uh, dating at the time, so he had to make a choice between us. And on our third date, Walter uh, and I are just sitting in the car talking. Yeah, really talking. And he said, I, I love going fishing with my mother. He said, I really didn't care about uh, catching any fish. In fact, a lot of times I didn't put bait on it. But she brought Limburger cheese. And I said, Limburger cheese? And he says, you like Limburger cheese? I said, I love it. He, he said, will you marry me? All my life I've looked for a girl that liked Limburger cheese. So I held him to it because I knew he'd never ask again. We've been married 52 and a half years. 
Well, when we started out, I never really had much idea where things were going to go. But uh, Jerry had a plan in mind. <laughs> and there we went. Well, I've had a good life. I can't complain. If I drop off the edge of the world tomorrow, I'll be perfectly happy. <laughs> but the fact that Jerry is a lot in my life is about all I can say. My mother was a very good oil painter and watercolors and was very critical of my art to the point where I just stopped. And uh, my art became photography. And I didn't realize how important a sense of composition was to photography until I saw some other people's photographs. Uh, so for years, my, my art was photography. Uh, then after we retired, uh, we w uh, joined the local uh, Gem and Mineral Club and found out that they taught uh, different rock-related art at Wild Acres, which was the cheapest vacation you've ever seen. And uh, Walter and I uh, became frequent habitues of this. I learned faceting and how to make cabochons. Uh, I learned silversmithing. So I make my own jewelry and really enjoy that. But I was surprised to find that I could do scrimshaw and uh, do sculpture because I had no idea I could do that. Some of it I've sold, some of it I wear, some of it's in the cabinet. Uh, so, uh, some of my photographs I've actually uh, made into posters and they've been sold for office uh, decorations. I, I sort of went crazy with cats. Uh, we had two Siamese, uh, Stuff and Nonsense, and when they died, uh, well, I got a breeder, and she was so expensive, I said, if I paid that much, I'm going to breed her. So we had a litter of three kittens, and one of them ended up to being the International Siamese of the Year. And that got me hooked on Siamese and Oriental short hairs. And I became a household pet judge, we only have one cat now. Walter and I have had a number of adventures. Uh, we've gone to the Grand Canyon, Rice Canyon, Yellowstone, and a lot of other places like that, and really enjoyed each other. But I remember the time that we went to an antimony mine and we got stuck in a mud puddle. And then there was the time that we were in the Puerto Rican rainforest, and uh, our plane was uh, about two hours from takeoff, and I saw some uh, split-leaf philodendron I wanted to photograph. So I said, Walter, just stop here. Well, he didn't. He backed up into a ditch. And we were on a single rut road, so the opportunity to see somebody coming was pretty limited. So Walter ended up having to take a tree branch on the uh, Volkswagen we had rented and tried to pull it up while I'm gunning the car. He ended up covered in mud, and that's how we got on the plane. Yeah, it was a uh, the, oh, that was also the one where we had the fire on the boat. Uh, the uh, couple we went with, uh, she was a classmate of mine from Drexel, and her husband was a psychiatrist. So she was a home economics major and decided she wanted to make bread on the boat because it was so warm for, and good for rising. But we didn't notice that the uh, oven was connected to the alcohol tank with Tigon tubing. 
So as the oven was heating up, it melted the Tigon tubing and sprayed alcohol all over the uh, inside of the boat and it went whoosh. So uh, I immediately turned off the feed to the alcohol. She grabs the baby and says, oh my God, the baby, the baby, and runs to the stern where her husband holds her. I'm trying to get the fire out and I, I, I pull the pin, I squeeze, I aim and I squeeze, nothing happens. And the only light was the fire. So I hand this to Walter I, because I knew where there was another fire extinguisher. I get that and we both get there and get it to, uh, off at the same time. Well, I didn't really think much about it. The other fellow just sat at the stern of the boat with his wife. So the next morning, he comes up on deck, totally naked, and goes, ta-da! And I looked at him and I said, so what? And I embarrassed him so much, he jumped in the water. Uh, it's the last time we saw that couple. We uh, love to go down to uh, North Carolina uh, at, uh, at Wild Acres, and that's where I learned gem cutting. I spent 10 weeks with a master gem cutter uh, studying how to cut gems. Unfortunately, he developed cancer about the same time I did, and his prognosis isn't much better than mine. So maybe we'll meet again in the great uh, lapidary in the sky. Um, I started itching. And I went to the dermatologist. He gave me a cream. It didn't work. Then uh, that Monday, I really felt punky. So I went to my internist. And he sent me to the ER. Uh, because I was jaundiced, and the uh, the itching was actually because of the bilirubin building up in my body. And they tried doing ultrasound, they tried doing uh, several other tests, and there was a mass around my pancreas. So they uh, tried a biopsy on it. I'm very allergic to iodine. And uh, they use that for a CAT scan. And every single physician I dealt with wanted to do a CAT scan with iodine. And the surgeon at Johns Hopkins said, uh, you are our protocol demands that you do this uh, CAT scan with iodine uh, after the surgery to make sure we got everything. I said, let me understand this. The chemotherapy worked, which by the way, it didn't. The surgery worked and the patient died confirming the success. I don't think that dog hunts. So over the summer, I was feeling pretty good. I was taking cooking lessons. I took some art lessons, uh, drawing lessons, because uh, I, wanted to uh, fill the time. And then uh, I started to feel punk again. My legs started to swell. And uh, it got to the point where uh, I went to the internist, the oncologist, the orthopedic surgeon. None of them dealt with the swelling. So I went to my cardiologist's physician assistant, and she says, you have lymphedema. I'm going to write a script for you to go to the lymphedema clinic. And right now, that's what's bothering me the most. The fluid builds up. And at one point, they took five quarts of fluid out of my stomach. Uh, now we're taking about a quart every other day but at least it's keeping me more comfortable. The last time I went to see my oncologist, he said, face it, the chemo isn't working. Uh, 
and you really are ready for hospice. It turns out I have the gene for pancreatic cancer. So it probably would have come back no matter what they did. But I I feel I've lived a really rich life. I've done things that most people have never done. I've enjoyed a network of friends and it's just a wonderful environment. So yeah, I I, I don't have regrets about going other than leaving my husband. And uh, I've always taken care of him and he always expected to die before me. And I know it's hard for him to handle it. So long, it's been good to know you.